Good morning, good afternoon. This is uh, John Morgan, the marketing manager here at Amatech TMC. Um, thank you so much for joining our webinar, uh, Effects and Mitigation of Magnetic Fields and Acoustics for SEMTEM and E-beam Lithography Instruments. A um, couple ground rules here. We have a lot of attendees, so everybody is on uh, mute for the moment. Um, we will be taking questions at the end. So uh, yeah, we'd really love to get your questions. You can uh, type them into the box on the right hand side of your screen. And uh, Mike's gonna try to leave five or 10 minutes at the end uh, to answer questions. Um, so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Mike Georgialis, our uh, manager of business development. Thanks, John. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Like John said, my name is Mike Georgialis. I'm, I head up sales here at TMC for our active systems. We focus a lot on the scanning electron microscope, transmission electron microscope, and e-beam lithography market. I have a background in physics. I've been with TMC for about eight years now, focusing on electric, electric, electromagnetic fields, acoustics, and vibration control, which we had a webinar uh, about a month ago on vibration control for, for such instruments. And today I'll be talking about magnetic fields and acoustics for SEM, TEM, E-beam, and E-beam lithography instruments. The majority of our time today will be spent on magnetic fields, which is a bit more of a robust and complex topic. And we're gonna start with sources of magnetic disturbances. We'll spend a little bit of time about, on measuring, how to measure them, and, and what do our measurement plots look like when we go out there with the sensor to measure magnetic fields. We're briefly going to touch on the basic construction of your general E-beam instrument and show how magnetic fields might affect it. Then we're going to delve into how we mitigate magnetic fields using active magnetic field cancellation systems and passive magnetic field suppression systems. Then we're going to switch over to acoustics for the second half of our presentation. I should say more like second third of our presentation, last third of our presentation. And we'll talk about sources of acoustic and barometric noise. We'll talk about what barometrics are in that section as well. And then we'll talk about how they, if these barometrics affect e-beam instruments and then mitigation approaches for acoustics as well. Starting with magnetic fields, we're gonna talk about sources. And when we look at sources of magnetic fields, we're really thinking about two different types of places where magnetic fields will originate from. We're talking about industrial fields versus, versus natural fields. So industrial fields are basically anything that's man-made. And the most common type of man-made field would be AC, alternating current from power lines and equipment. Uh, that, that's 50, 60 hertz, 50, 50 hertz in much of the world and in Europe, 60 hertz here in the United States. And, um, and that's the, 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 the frequency at which power is generated from a, uh, a rotating turbine, for example, that's just a rotating generator that's, uh, that's generating power. And so we get this positive and negative fluctuation at a rate of 50 to 60 hertz as the magnets turn with inside the coil and generate the magnetic field. Other industrial fields are like DC fields. Uh, or slow changing DC fields. And later on in this presentation, we'll, we'll use the words quasi DC um, uh, to, to, to really talk about a shift in DC field. But these are things like large massive objects that gather a lot of magnetic field lines as they move. Things like elevators and trains um, and you know ground currents that could be from electric train wires and things like that. So, you know, um, even like large carts and large metallic objects, anything ferromagnetic uh, could cause a uh, uh, DC field to change. And E-beam instruments also uh, can, can cause shifts in DC fields and affect other DC, uh, other E-beam instruments nearby. Natural fields are things like lightning. You know, when lightning strikes, we see a broadband electromagnetic impulse. Uh, we also see cosmic and solar radiation, solar flares and things like that can be very high frequency and they can cause uh, you know, disturbance and static in your radios and things like that. Uh, and even the Earth's own magnetic field is something we, we, we characterize as a, as a natural magnetic field and it's something that we've got to consider when we talk about um, magnetic fields. And then there's two types of magnetic fields. We have static fields, which never change. Uh, and then we have dynamic fields, which I'll talk on in the next slide. Uh, 
steady magnetic fields are something, a good example is like the Earth's magnetic field, where uh, the Earth is has a constant magnetic field, and it depends on where you are on the Earth, you'll experience different magnetic fields. And what a, the way a static magnetic field is going to affect an uh, electron beam tool is um, it's going to cause a constant force and a constant, I shouldn't say force, but a constant deflection uh, due to the repulsion or attraction of wherever you are in that sort of body of magnetic fields of the Earth. And electron beam tools being uh, they, a beam of electrons, which are negatively charged particles, are going to be affected by, by such fields. But what's interesting about a static field is that it's not changing. So when you install an electron beam tool, you install it in one location and then you set all of its lenses and, and systems for the magnetic field from the earth in that location at that time. Since it's constant, you, uh, you set your scope and you basically can forget about it. But if you try to move that scope to a new location, you'd be in a new world uh, of magnetic fields and you'd have to reset it for that constant static earth field. And then dynamic fields are fields that are changing. So AC fields are by nature always changing because you have a magnitude that's changing from one polarity uh, at one magnitude, and then over time it changes to another polarity to, to the negative polarity um, as a, as a, as a, at you know sixty times a second. Uh, an AC field can be constant, so it can be a constant magnitude, but it's gonna always be a constant changing of polarity. So that's what we talk about when we talk about a changing, that's why we call an AC field a, a dynamic field. And DC fields are also, uh, can, 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 can also change over time. But, uh, you know, a, a constant DC field is something more along the lines of a static field, like the Earth's field. But when a DC field starts to change slowly, we start using the words quasi-DC fields. So these are very, very slow changing fields, like a magnetic uh, like a ferromagnetic object for like an elevator or sometimes even maybe a garbage cart or a truck. Something ferromagnetic moving along is going to distort magnetic field lines uh, in the environment and we'll consider that a quasi-DC field. Um, on the right-hand side, we have a couple images. This is a, on the right, uh, we have the top image is a very, very common uh, sort of swaying back and forth at a relatively high frequency that's very typical of what you would see with a magnetic field, an AC magnetic field disturbance horizontally. And you also see that in the lower image here um, in the top half of the image. But when you have a DC field, a DC shift, you're going to see a shift of the image and we see a DC shift happening here. And this is interesting because that's an instantaneous DC shift. It's a shift of a DC field that all of a sudden wasn't there and then very quickly was there. And that's going to be something that you're going to see from maybe an e-beam tool turning on uh, next door uh, in, in a nearby environment. So you have that rapid shift in DC that's going to be that's going to show up in the image. And when we measure them, we get graphs that look like this. And there's different units that are pretty that are used. Sometimes we use Tesla, named for Nikolai Tesla. Sometimes we use Gauss, named for um, named for yeah, I forget Gauss's first name, but we have Gauss's law, which we'll be talking about later in this in this presentation. Um, but we have to take measurements in all three axes because we're in a three-dimensional environment and we have a three-dimensional instrument with a beam, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So we've got to be focused on your left and right or X, uh, Z fields, your front and back or Y fields, or your vertical fields, your Z fields, uh, coming up from the floor and from the ceiling. And there's two ways we measure. You can measure with coil magnetometers. So coil magnetometers are basically a coil of wire that is going to get this, that'll sense a magnetic field. And because of Faraday's law, that, mag that, mag that, that magnetic field will induce a current in the coil proportionate to the field. And so you can get uh, some feeling of a changing magnetic field through that or flux gate magnetometers which are a little bit more accurate and they use magnetic permeability principles, meaning it's a high permeability magnetic material, which magnetic fields are drawn to. So you're going to be able to sense um, magnetic fields being absorbed in that magnetic, high magnetic permeability magnet material, which will then generate a signal that uh, that gives you that's proportionate to the fields that it's absorbing. Uh, and then we look at two different types of measurements. And what I want to talk about here is the difference between a DC disturbance and an AC disturbance. And 
if you look at the x-axis on this graph of, for DC disturbance, this is a very classic quasi-DC disturbance because what you have here is uh, a, a period of time of a little bit over 180 seconds, so roughly three minutes, where measurement was taken of DC fields uh, in Tesla that are sort of varying over time. And then what we see here at one, what, 120 seconds at two, two minutes is a very, very rapid rise or a rise of, you know, over the course of the next 10 or 20 so seconds uh, of a change in DC field, and then that comes back down again. And this is very characteristic of a quasi-DC shift that you would see from a large ferromagnetic object moving nearby, like an elevator or a, a train or something like that. Um, and then in the AC field, though, we don't really care about the time domain. So yeah, we could take a difference we could take a measurement uh, for for some time, some period of time, but what we care about when we're looking at an AC field are the component frequencies. So we look at an FFT of the signal, uh, a fast Fourier transform of the signal, and we can identify frequencies at which we're seeing uh, uh, the alternating fields. And here's a very very common signature of a 60 hertz field. So here's 10 hertz on your y on your x axis. Here's 100 hertz on your y on your x axis. Sorry, and it's at a magnitude of roughly 20, 30, 40, 45 or so uh, uh, a nanotesla. So at the 45 nanotesla peak at 60 hertz. And then what's so interesting about this is that we see the harmonics. So we see a 120 harmon uh, hertz harmonic. We see a, um, a 300 hertz harmonic. And then they kind of uh, trail off as we get into higher frequencies. So how do these affect e-beam tools? And I want to take a step back and kind of talk a little bit about the basic and, and oversimplified example of, a, of an electron beam tool. And what you have in any electron beam tool, you have three important parts. You have your source, you have your column, and you have your sample in your sample chamber. So this is going to be your electron source. And it could be anything from a, from a gas, a, a plasma gas emission, to, uh, to a tungsten filament emission of electrons. And you're generating these electrons and you create this electron beam, which then you send down through the column. And this beam is gonna get focused through optics, magnetic optics. So there's gonna be magnetic coils in there that generate their own fields. And the, the, the electron microscope is gonna use that to focus and, and move and control the beam. And then that beam is gonna be uh, incident on a sample where that'll then generate secondary electrons, which are detected by electron detectors and then processed into an image. So electron beams, as I mentioned before, are negative is basically a collection of negatively charged particles that's trying to be focused by magnetic fields. So what happens when we have this external field that's not part of the system? Well, well a horizontal magnetic disturbance field, for example, is gonna come in and it's gonna want to deflect the beam. So you get this beam deflection with a horizontal field uh, coming in from uh, maybe a power line to the left or hand right hand side of the room, and you're going to get this left and right um, deflection of the beam where it's going to miss the sample, and you're not going to be finding what you're looking for when you hit that sample. And you get those waves and the images as that field changes uh, in polarity and exerts either a positive or a negative repulsion or attraction on the beam. But then you have these vertical fields, which uh, which come from the um, which come from the ground or from the ceiling, and the vertical field's gonna the vertical field's going to want to uh, repel or attract it by the beam and want to elongate uh, or or shorten or compress the beam, uh, depending on the polarity of it, and that's going to result in sort of out of focus or in focus images. So what do we do when we want to suppress uh, magnetic fields, uh, dynamic fields? And we, do, we, one of the first and most important approaches is active magnetic field ca cancellation systems, which, in its, uh, which are composed of what we call Helmholtz type coils. And Helmholtz coil, every, uh, so a Helmholtz coil is going to run, what you want to do when you create a Helmholtz coil is you use Gauss's law to generate a current through a coil. So you, ge you generate a current through a coil and then Gauss's law will tell you by the right hand rule that that current's going to have an associated magnetic field that then curves around it in the direction of, uh, uh, in the direction according to the right hand rule. So a good example is if I'm looking into the page and I'm looking at a wire coming into me, 
coming coming straight at me and there's current coming straight at me into the page and use my right hand I run my thumb along the length of the wire and my, my fingers will curl and my fingers gonna curl in the direction of the circular direction that that magnetic field is then generated and we'll talk about that in a later slide so we have these Helmholtz type coils we say Helmholtz type because a true Helmholtz coil is round but round coils are a little bit impractical to manufacture and a little bit impractical to install around types of instruments like these. So we say Helmholtz type coils because most of the coils that are installed commercially are gonna be actually square coil pairs. And why do we use the word coils? And let me talk about the construction of these coils. What I'm looking at here is a very simple, what I call a Helmholtz coil freestanding cage or frame. And when I look at the first coil in front of me, this, this, this part of the frame that's facing me right here, what's actually running in here are several turns of wire. So in this example, I've got 12 loops, I should say. So each, I have 12 current carrying wires running like this in circles around this front face of this cage. And then I have a pair on the other side. I have a matching pair on the back side. So I have another 12 loops of coil running around this frame. And then I create a box. So I create a six box, a six sided box of coils uh, around here. And so that's the first part is my home halts coil set. My second part is my sensor and feedback system. So it's a feedback control system where I place a sensor near the area where I want to get cancellation. Uh, and I'll talk about cancel, uh, you know, the, the, the magnitude and the uniformity of that cancellation later. But the point is we have a sensor and feedback control system where I've got a sensor here sensing a disturbance field. And the goal of any feedback loop is to try to cancel out, or to, is to try to keep the sensor at zero. So my sensor is gonna sense a disturbance field and then it's gonna send a signal to the controller, which is then going to send a signal to uh, a, volt, a current to the cables, to the coils. And that current is gonna be a current that's gonna to try to be an opposite polarity and of equal magnitude to what's being sensed at the sensor. So eventually you kind of come to the stabilization where the sensor is being kind of stay, stay coming to as close of a point to a zero point as possible. And so one of the effects of that is um, we deal with uniformity issues in a field, which are subject to the, phys the physics of the, the, the locations of the coils. And what you can't really get is infinite cancellation within the, within the, the enclosure of the box. What you're striving for is cancellation in the area where you need it, which I'll talk about later. And I'll digress from the physics for one second just to talk about configurations because there's a whole lot of ways we can configure these coils. Uh, and they're gonna be a very, they're dependent on the needs of any application. So what we have here is one example of a, uh, of a scanning electron microscope. And this is in a room and we've placed our Helmholtz coils in six sided box on the walls of the room. And this is one very common type of configuration to get rather large cancellation volume in the area of the scope. Um, so you don't say you have a room that's too large or you don't need to necessarily you can't mount things on the walls or whatever reason we can do cages that mount on the floor uh, to, to also create these six sided boxes of Helmholtz coils and we even mounted them inside enclosures. So here's a transmission electron microscope that's roughly 12 feet tall and we've mounted a set of coils inside here to, 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 to create magnetic field cancellation. Uh, so they're so when we do a configuration of a cancellation system, it's not a one size fits all type, type situation. You've got to look at your magnitude of fields that need to be canceled. You have to look at the uh, volume that needs to be canceled. And you, have to you have to design a, a, a system of coils that can provide uh, a uniform cancellation field. And that's where we're talking about when we talk about uniform suppression field uniformity and cancellation volume. So the first thing that we're gonna do in our simplest examples of Helmholtz type cancellation systems is we're gonna assume that the field that we're trying to cancel is from a point source far away. So it's decayed to a point where it can be assumed to be a, a rather uniform field. It's not changing much uh, with distance because magnetic fields, and one of the things that we're always gonna struggle with when we're designing cancellation systems they're gonna vary over distance approximately proportionate to one over R squared. So the further you get away from your source, you're gonna have a very rapid drop off of magnitude. We'll call that a gradient. 
but then eventually it'll move into, a, but eventually it'll become asymptotic to a point where it's relatively uniform over distance uh, by, you know, proportionate to one over R squared. And this example um, shows us, well, how do we create a better uniformity? Um, and, and, and what does this R squared decay uh, have to do with the performance of a magnetic field cancellation system? Well, because magnetic field from, from, a, from a source is going to come in and try to be uniform, you've got to create a field that's going to then cancel it, a uniform field that's going to cancel it. But you can't really create a uni uniform field physically because when you have a coil that's generating a field, that coil is always going to be, the, the field that's generated by Gauss's law from that coil is always going to be subject to the one over R squared decay with distance. So the best you can, so you're always creating non-uniform fields to try to cancel assumed to be uniform sources. So what you do is you strive for a cancellation volume where you can get to a level that has acceptable uniformity that matches that um, that matches that, that 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 you hope matches the uniformity of the of the of the disturbance field. And here's a really great example of magnetic field lines and how those magnetic field lines are generated by a system and the type of cancellation volume that we get sort of in the center. And what we're looking at here is a pair is is one pair of Helmholtz coils. And we're looking into the page and we're looking at a current that is running into the page. And I know that because I'm using my right hand rule and I have uh, this little arrow indicating the circular motion of this current. And so when I use my, when I point my thumb into the page, I rotate my, my fingers around there and I see that I have this, this clockwise rotating current through this coil. And then, uh, then that, coil, that current's gonna run down the length of this, down, down, you know, at the bottom, you know, sort of into the page, well, probably several inches into the page, and then it's gonna come back out at me. Again, I'm at the right hand, right hand rule. I have my, um, my current coming in here and then curving in the counterclockwise direction. So this is a wire that we're looking at. This is a Helmholtz coil effectively with the current running into the page here and then running out of the page here. And then it runs back up into the page, turns down the page, runs out of the page. And then we have a matching coil here that's doing the exact same thing because what they're gonna do is they're both going to, to, to generate their own magnetic field lines. And those magnetic field lines are gonna be in the same direction and they're gonna wanna join. So what we start to see here is high density of magnetic field lines very close to the coils. And then as we get further and further from the coils, we get magnetic field lines that are of lower density, but they're gonna to wanna to join. So what we start to see here is we start to generate this sort of cancellation volume where my magnetic field lines are relatively straight. They've joined together and I have now achieved a cancellation volume where I have relatively straight uh, uniform magnetic field lines. And the more I change that, the more I try to play with that volume, I can make it larger or smaller, that's going to start affecting my ability uh, to generate uniform cancellation fields. And when we start thinking about how much we can suppress within a uniform cancellation volume, it's a simple, it's a simple formula and it's a question of uncertainty. So we can never really guarantee an absolute level of suppression. But what we can do is we can say, well, we have a certain percentage uniformity of fields within our cancellation volume. And from that certain, certain percentage of uniformity, we can guarantee some, um, some level of suppression. So for a great example here is very simple one is 100% over 10% uncertainty is 10 times reduction. So what that really means is I have uh, this, this, this orange area here, that's going to represent my area in which my uniformity is within 10%. Okay, so I have a 10% uniformity area, that means I can guarantee 10 times suppression of an incoming field, whatever that field may be. Uh, but as I get closer to the center of the cage, I now have a smaller volume, and therefore I have greater uniformity. So in that greater uniformity area, then I can guarantee suppression of say 20 times if it's a 5% uniformity. And if I go even further in, which I don't show here, but if say if I had a 2% uniformity area, well, it's a very, very highly uniform area. At that very small area, then I can get 100 times suppression. But it's impractical to try to think about uh, extremely small areas because we're dealing with microscopes here. Some microscope columns 
can be very, very large. It can be two meters or more in diameter. So we're trying to find, so we're trying to generate uniform fields over extremely long cancellation volumes. And one of the things that helps me uh, uh, to, to shift gears here is uniformity can be quite disturb, quite, 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 quite uh, confusing. So one of the things that's a little bit more easy to understand when we're starting to actually talk about fields that we're trying to suppress, we actually want to think a little bit more along the lines of suppression field magnitude. And this chart is a really good example of, of how a two-coil Helmholtz system generates a field of varying magnitude. And you can deduce from this chart not only the, ma the normalized magnitude of the field, but can, you can also deduce the uniformity of that field. And what we're showing here is a theoretical system of two Helmholtz coils. We have a normalized distance of one coil here on the right-hand side and one coil here on the left-hand side. And each one of their co these coils is doing their thing and generating a magnetic field. And they're generating a magnetic field of a certain magnitude. And this is the normalized magnitude of the field that they're generating. And so that's, this makes a lot of sense because very close to the coil here, I have a magnitude of a field that's roughly 120% of the disturbance field. Uh, and then it's going to decay one over r squared towards the center of the cage, start to join with the field that's generated from the other coil, and we sort of get this, this uh, uh, normalized magnitude field, which in the center, which is in this blue area, shows the protected volume that I'm trying to achieve. And within this protected volume, I'm between 100 and, well, 100 and 100% of volume, but I have a very, very low curve, so it's relatively straight here. In this case, I'm using a 2.4% uniformity. So in my protected volume here, I have a relatively straight line at a very at a relatively high uniformity. And what's important about this chart is magnetic field cancellation systems not only generate a field with inside themselves, but they also generate a field outside themselves, which we'll talk about in a later example. So a common question that we encounter with a magnetic field cancellation system is, well, that's great if I have a source and it's far away and I have a relatively uniform field inside my, uh, inside my room and my, my, my scope is subject to a relatively uniform field, but that's not my case. M my problem is, you know, for example, I have an electrical panel right inside the room or an elevator 10 feet away. Well, now we're talking about a, f a field that is nearby. So we're gonna talk about a field that's grad a gradient field. <clears throat> And a gradient field is a field that hasn't had enough space or enough distance to benefit from the one over r squared decay over distance and is still actually decaying quite quickly. So we have what we call a gradient field. And when you have a gradient field or a non-uniform field, your initial philosophies of trying to achieve high levels of uniformity within Helmholtz cage systems starts to go out the window because you can't cancel a gradient field using a uniform field. You need to cancel a gradient field using a gradient field. So there's different tips and tricks that we do to, uh, to, to, to combat gradient fields. And some of them, uh, but they're all geared towards generating a gradient field. So what we might do is we might vary the number of turns in a coil. You guys might remember from before, I was saying that, well, the Helmholtz coil systems that we make are consisting of pairs. You have, for example, a pair of 12, of 12 coils, say on the right-hand side, and you have a set of 12 coils matching it on the left-hand side. And that's what we have here in this example. We have uh, a set of coils on the right-hand side, and we have a set of coils on the left-hand side. And what we did was we, reduced the theoretical amount of coils in my right hand uh, in my right hand loops. So I went down to six six turns, I should say, uh, here, but I kept this at 12 turns. And what that did was that kept my left hand coil operating at full power. It's always pumping out 12 turns worth of current. Therefore, it's going to have a much higher level of magnetic field. And I've lowered this to roughly six turns, and it's putting out about, uh, about half as much power. So when the when the, uh, the the when the when the fields join together in the center of the cage, I now have a very non-uniform area in which I'm trying to get cancellation. And the goal is to try to get this curve, this this non-uniform cancellation curve, to try to 
match that gradient that's coming from your, your nearby disturbance source. Other ways to do this is just to use a single coil system. If I wanted to, I could completely eliminate this coil and get an extremely steep curve from my left-hand side coil, which would then be basically subject to one over R squared only uh, and have no effect from uh, any, any opposite coil. Another question we see is, will my active cancellation system affect nearby tools? And the answer is, that is a possibility because we're dealing with a system that uh, that generates magnetic fields to repel disturbance fields. So um, we'll talk about how those fields then, uh, which are generated by your coils, are going to be um, um, affecting nearby instruments, which is definitely a possibility. And another question that happens is, uh, that comes along often is, can I place them near one another? So say I have a room and I have sent it several scanning electron microscopes in the room. Well, um, can I then place magnetic field cancellation systems around each scope? And the answer is, yeah, in most cases, that's not a problem because they're all active cancellation systems. They're all closed loop systems. Um, the effects you're going to see from one system is just going to be read as a disturbance field from another nearby system, and it'll cancel it out accordingly. We've never seen crosstalk or anything like that between systems that are installed next to one another. In fact, I've seen them help each other. So going back to the effects of, insta uh, of, um, of magnetic field cancellation systems on nearby instruments, uh, here's, a, here's a real world example where we had two electron microscopes in the same room. And we have a scanning electron microscope here, uh, which is also a focused ion beam scope. And then here we had a transmission electron microscope. And the columns are roughly the center. So our protected areas that we're trying to achieve in this plan view are roughly in the center of each one of these instruments. And we measured the distance between these columns, um, which was a little bit more than 2.8 meters. But what we did was we put a cage. Uh, we were having magnetic field issues on this instrument. And, um, and there were no magnetic fields on this instrument because it could have been because maybe this instrument was more sensitive to magnetic fields. It may have been because the disturbance sources were closer to this instrument than this instrument. But whatever the reason was, we, we, we had we had to install a cage around this one, uh, but uh, but didn't um, but didn't need one around this one. So the question was, well, if I put my cage on this one and say a field a disturbance field is coming in from the left, my cage is going to react and it's going to send a repulsion field. So it's going to send a repulsion field out here to the right, but it's also going to send a repulsion field out here. It's also going to send send a field of equal and opposite magnitude to the left here. So what effectively happens is you have a disturbance field coming in gets repelled here, but the cage doesn't really know, but the cage is a rather, but the cage doesn't know what side, nor does it care what side it's coming from. It's really going to just kick out that feed, that disturbance field over to the left-hand side here. So say a field comes in 10 Tesla and it hits the cage, what we're going to see is a 10 Tesla disturbance out here from the left-hand side because of the nature of Helmholtz coils. And that's the concern. Do, am I going to then kick my incoming field from the right-hand side over to my column here and now get a, get a problem on my 10 where I didn't have one before because I installed a cage here. And the answer is, well, we got to model that. And the way we modeled that, I'm sorry, this is a reverse model. But uh, what we did was we took at this cage and we took our dimensions of our cage at 1.3 meters by 1.3 meters. And we modeled it here in a normalized x-axis. And we modeled its compensation field. So we generated a constant compensation volume that's roughly the size of the, of the column, which in this case is, uh, is plus or minus 12%, 12.5% uh, of the volume of the cage. So for example, if this is a 1.3 meter cage, then the protective volume that we're, that we're trying to achieve here is 25% of 1.3 meters, so roughly now uh, roughly 300 millimeters or so. Um, so we have a, a 300 millimeter area where we're trying to achieve, in this case, 10% uniformity to get 10 times guaranteed suppression. And when we model that, what we see is we see what we typically ex uh, expect to see, very high fields of the coil, at the coil. It decays as we get into the volume of the cage. It begins to join with our effects from our other from our opposite coil. We get our uniformity area of 10%. And then we have a rapid rise. But then now what we care about is what's going on outside the cage. 
And then outside the cage, we have our typical one over R squared jump out of the disturbance field. And so when we look at roughly one meter away from the cage, we see a compensation field below 20%. So what that's telling me is, uh, in, in numbers, for example, if I have a 100 nanotesla field coming in from the left-hand side here, I'm gonna generate uh, enough to cancel it out in my cancellation volume and knock that down to roughly 10%, 10, 10, 10 nanotesla within my cancellation volume. But then the first thing I'm gonna see is 100 nanotesla coming out from this coil here. But then that's gonna decay over one over our squared cage. And once I get to one meter away, I'm already at 20% of that field. So one meter away, I'm already down to 20 nanotesla. And so that's the effect that we see here. If you see a 100 nanotesla field coming in here, it's gonna come out of 100 nanotesla here, but then one meter away, we're gonna be down to 20 nanotesla, and then even less as we go further. So the answer is, well, does that, um, so that's how much, so the answer is, okay, if your field is 100 nanotesla, and you get 20 nanotesla, one meter away, and then say maybe one or two nanotesla, 2.8 meters away, well, what's, how much, how big of a disturbance field do I then have to see on the right-hand side here to then generate a field that's a problem for the scope? So you have a fairly high level of then of, 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 of safety of, of, of having that field kicked over from this cage. It's gonna be on the order of a one to 2,000 nanotesla um, magnitude field to, uh, to be kicked over. And then when you're getting fields to that level, you're worried, you're starting to worry about both scopes. And the final question we were gonna we see often is uh, a little bit of a spoiler, but um, the question is, can I use my ACS, my active cancellation system, in a passively shielded room? And I'm gonna jump to passive shielding in two slides. Uh, but the answer is yes, but we cannot have the coils in contact with uh, the shielding. So this is a very typical uh, way we would stand off the coil. So this is, we're looking down at the coil of the room here. We have our floor coil here, and we have a line, uh, a, a cable running up the wall here. And this is a six-sided box, which is mounted in a shielded room, which is then stood off using these standoffs so that the cables from the active cancellation system are not in, con are not in contact and they're sufficiently standing off from the passive shield. And this is just an example of the type of performance that you'll see from a scanning electron microscope when you use an active cancellation system. You've got your very typical horizontal AC waves in the image here. You turn on your cancellation system and you can immediately suppress the disturbance field and get a much clearer image. And this is why people uh, buy active cancellation systems so they get, the, they get these clean images. They do have limitations. And one of the biggest limitations of, of active systems, but it's a limitation of really any system, is that fields change over time. And magnetic fields are notorious for changing over time because uh, there's always construction. There's always, uh, there could always be events that are not captured during an initial analysis of a site, a site survey, uh, that might then become evident later. So when you design a magnetic field cancellation system, you try to design it to, to provide as much cancellation po as, as possible. But you're also gonna um, factor in the geometry of the site, the geometry of the instrument, the ergonomics for the user, all sorts of things. And you try to create something that's gonna be uh, kind of meet all needs. But you can sometimes fall into a trap because as fields change over time, one configuration may no longer work as well as say another configuration. You cannot place multiple, multiple tools within a single system. These are one sensor systems and we have cancellation volumes that are relatively small and tightly controlled. Um, so really you can't make a system big enough to create a cancellation volume big enough to create, create a uniform cancellation field um, within one system. So that's really something that's a, that's a major no-no. You don't wanna try to put two tools in one system. Uh, one, or the cage size and uniformity limits. So we are limited by physics here. We can make larger cages and we get larger cages and from larger cages, we get better cancellation volumes and better uniformity. You have bigger coils, you have those coils spaced out, spaced out further and you have larger volumes and that just follows uh, through, um, um, that, that, that just follows through logic and geometry 
But what starts to happen is the bigger and bigger and bigger you make a cage, yeah, you're gonna make a bigger and bigger uniformity volume, which is great. But what starts to happen is you start to bump up to the current limits of your power supply because you have larger and larger coils. You start to get inductive and resistive losses. Resistance due to the resistance of the wires, but inductive losses because as currents change, you also have induction losses. And so what that starts to do is you create this cancellation volume and that might, might, might be very nice and big, but as your fields change, because we're talking about dynamic fields, you start to reduce the amount of magnitude, the magnitude of the field that you can cancel. So there's a trade-off. You can get better uniformity, but you can't you can't cancel fields of as high magnitude because you're starting to get, get limited by losses to, your, to by power supply losses. You always run up to the fact that uh, you know we, we try our best to cancel gradient fields, but there's always possibilities where fields are just way too steep of gradients to design magnetic fields that match those. So you know you've got to watch out for 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 highly very steep gradient fields when you're trying to cancel gradient fields using um, modified cancellation systems. And you've always got to consider the effects on other instruments. One of the other one of the other major limitations is uh, electron microscopes can have extremely tight tolerances for uh, for magnetic fields, and we start to see at place times where may where the scope itself um, tends to tends to create non-uniform and or uniform fields because a magnetic because a, a microscope is going to be a large magnetic object and a large magnetic object is always going to want to be sucking magnetic fields uh, into it and generating sort of its own magnetic field characteristics and when an instrument manufacturer goes out there and they do a survey of a room they're going to do that survey in an empty room and they might say well this room is uh, good for to install this instrument, or this room needs magnetic field remediation to m install this instrument. But the problem is, you've taken that survey in an empty room. But then you move an electron microscope inside it, which is an instrument that is extremely complex. It has a lot of its own magnetic fields that it's generating, and it's a large ferromagnetic object that's going to be gathering and concentrating magnetic field lines of its own. Add to that, we're talking about we we may, we may sometimes see larger scopes that require very large cancellation volumes, and so what I'm trying to portray here in these two images is a model of an extremely large transmission electron microscope, a 300 kilovolt scope that's roughly that is a column that is roughly two meters long, and in one example, I've modeled a metallic column placed on a metallic platform versus uh, inside an enclosure versus just the enclosure with a coil set mounted inside the enclosure. You can see once I add the metallic objects into this, the simulation versus a simulation just in an enclosure, we see uh, magnetic field lines all being concentrated and joined by the, by the metallic objects, especially the platform here. So that starts to affect the performance of our system, but it also starts to affect our ability to measure fields within that system and also our ability, which then translates to uh, a very difficult uh, ability to generate uh, feedback loops that are actually measuring the true disturbance fields versus feedback loops that are reacting to changes within the ferromagnetic environment that the sensor is placed in. So it can be very, very challenging to do large transmission electron microscopes uh, and get good uniformity. We're going to switch to passive magnetic field suppression systems. And passive shielding uh, uses a, a shielding type called lossy shielding, which relies on Lentz's law, so uh, and, and to some extent Faraday's law. But what happens in a passive shield is we have a large contiguous piece of, of conductive material. In most cases, it's aluminum. And what's going to happen in a passive shield is you're going to have an incident magnetic field. And that incident changing magnetic field is going to then generate electron motion inside the, the plate or the shielding. And that electron motion is going to take the form of eddy currents. That was moving electrons are called eddy currents. And an eddy current is going to do what you expect a moving current to do. It's going to generate a magnetic 
field that's equal and opposite uh, to, um, uh, you know, I'm sorry, that, that, that relies on the right-hand rule, the direction of the current. And it just so happens due to Lenz's law that the magnetic field generated by the eddy current is equal and opposite to the magnetic, to the polarity of the magnetic field that is incident. So we also have a repulsion system when we have a passive magnetic field shielding system. And so we use highly conductive materials. Mostly we use aluminum, mostly we use copper. Um, I say we, but I, by we, I mean general people that, 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 that seek to produce magnetic field cancellation systems. TMC actually doesn't make passive suppression systems. Um, but there's two types when we start to uh, talk about passive shielding. We have source shielding and we have equipment shielding. So in source shielding, we try to find the source and we enclose it in a magnetic field and try to keep that shield from escaping the source, keep that field from escaping the source. Uh, but we also have equipment shielding. And in equipment shielding, we generally are, are shield an entire room. So you'll line the walls and ceiling and floor with this magnetically conducting material. And all of these uh, plates that are mounted on the walls and ceiling and uh, on floor, they're all gonna be contiguous plates and welded together because the key to eddy currents is to have as much surface area and as much uh, continuity throughout the shield as possible. So the most effective shields are single contiguous boxes. Another type of shield, and, and that's a lossy shield, and that's by far the most common type of shield that's installed in practice. The other type, uh, but one of the, the limitations of a lossy shield is that it relies on rapidly changing, it relies on a changing current to generate an eddy current, or I'm sorry, it reminds of, it relies on a changing magnetic field to generate an eddy, an eddy current. So it becomes less and less effective the lower frequency field you're trying to deal with. And therefore, once you start to get a DC and quasi-DC, lossy shielding becomes very ineffective. And in order to start looking at DC shielding um, or quasi-DC shielding, you need to move away from lossy shielding and you need to move into flux, flux entrapment shielding. And flux entrapment shielding is using a material of high magnetic permeability, like mu metal. And mu metal is a material which, which because of its high magnetic permeability, will want to suck in and hold magnetic field lines because magnetic fields want to live in an environment where uh, it's a lower energy for them to exist. And we call that magnetic permeability. So air has a certain permeability, but new metal, for example, has a much higher permeability. So magnetic fields can be drawn uh, to a high magnetic permeability, permeability shield. And mu metal and flux entrapment shields are extremely expensive. Usually we don't see them installed due to their cost prohibitiveness. And then one common question we see is, well, should I use copper or should I use aluminum uh, when I'm generating a passive shield? And, you know, copper is actually more conductive. It's a better material uh, for shielding than aluminum, uh, but it's very, very expensive. And uh, one of the reasons we use aluminum is because we have something called skin effects. And skin effects are a, uh, determine how deeply your incident magnetic field can penetrate into a material. And so higher frequency electron motion tends to occur close to the surface, like I'm sure, uh, but lower frequency uh, tends to, tend to, to, to penetrate deeper. So in order to cancel lower frequencies, you need to make materials thicker and thicker and thicker. And once you get into the frequencies we're sensitive to with alternating currents like AC fields, uh, you need to have a thickness of at least a quarter inch to start to cancel those due to the skin effects. So quarter inch thick copper is much, much more expensive than quarter, quarter inch aluminum. So we start to see aluminum uh, in most, uh, in most, in most um, electron microscope type applications. But when you look at MRIs, for example, which are running at frequencies of megahertz, and you're trying to protect instruments outside of the NMRI, MRI suite, you're gonna use copper because copper is a very effective shield and you're dealing with very, very high frequencies. So, uh, so copper is gonna be better uh, for that because you don't need to use as thick of copper. It'll be uh, cost-wise versus aluminum, you get a more benefit uh, for a thinner copper than you do for a thinner aluminum. 
We see a lot of the same limitations uh, uh, for passive systems. For example, they, they are designed for a facility at one point in time, just like an active system. Um, uh, we have uh, a, a passive system that's going to be designed for uh, one set of surveys or one point in time. And over time, the fields could change and we may be less, uh, we may see a less effect, effective field, a less, less effective shield. Uh, they're very, very expensive to, to implement. You know, we've got to basically move everything out of a room uh, and then bring in a, a construction crew to basically mount and weld uh, an envelope of aluminum throughout the entire room. And then um, they're unable to cancel true DC fields unless you start looking at the uh, higher flux, uh, flux entrapment type fields, the higher magnetic permeability fields. In summary, you've got to understand the application requirements and site conditions when you're designing an active or a passive system. Active systems can be very cost-effective cost uh, and they can be offered in a variety of configurations and they offer true DC cancellation. Passive systems work well for B-beam tools as well, but again, we don't really get much DC field cancellation from passive shields. So you might sometimes see you install a passive shield and then have to install um, um, uh, an active shield anyway. They can be very expensive and disruptive to, uh, to implement, especially if you're renovating a facility for a microscope. I'm gonna, skip, I'm gonna jump into acoustics now. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the difference between the types of acoustics that we see. Um, we're talking about audible acoustics. So we're talking about um, the things that you can hear. and the human low frequency threshold is roughly 20 hertz. An important part that we're going to talk about in the next slide is going to be the wavelengths of the acoustics that we're talking about and how these affect our instruments. Uh, human speech frequency is roughly 85 to 255 hertz and audible sounds, you know, this is anything you can hear. But then a more important part of acoustics is actually inaudible. And we're talking about things like pressure waves. And pressure waves can come from things like doors opening and closing. An elevator moving up and down a shaft can create what's called a pressure wave. When you turn your HVAC system on and off, we're talking about large volumes of air moving. Uh, and we're talking about long, long wavelengths. And with these wavelengths are actually often on the order of the size of a room. And so we're not really talking about waves bouncing off walls in a room. What we're really talking about are um, our, our, our pressure changes and variations, which, start, which, which are actually more like barometrics. So we use the word barometrics when we're talking about long, inaudible pressure waves. A really good example of a pressure wave is when you're driving along in your car and somebody maybe cracks a back window or just one window or ever so slightly, and you get this sort of reverberation uh, around 30 hertz and your ears are popping because of this reverberation. That's a very classic example of an acoustic barometric long wavelength uh, due to a resonance of a cavity in the car, which is you know, roughly one and a half meters. It's low frequency, you can't hear it, but you can feel it. This is a really, this is an example of just how acoustic wavelengths uh, re uh, are, are, are relate to frequency. And uh, on this chart, we have your voice between 85 and 255 hertz. And the red line here is wavelength versus frequency. So the takeaway from this chart is, as we go down in frequency, we start to get into longer wavelengths of our inaudible frequencies, 17 meters, even in some cases at these very low frequencies, below seven, low frequency wavelengths. And in this range here, uh, we have our problem frequencies. So we're talking about primarily low frequencies, uh, but also some in the audio audible range uh, for, for sensitive instruments. And the effect on a sense of its instrument is, well, audible waves, which are lower wavelengths, they tend to bounce off things. So audible wavelengths will hit the column or will hit the frame of the instrument and they'll insert their, their energy to it, um, uh, upon it, and cause you know, a vibration, a disturbance that registers a vibration. But pressure waves have a different effect because when we have a large volume of air moving and a barometric change in a facility from a an elevator or an HVAC system or a door opening and closing. What we see is an effect on the instrument's own isolation system. 
And so what we see is very common in electron beam instruments. What we'll have are, is an instrument which has an air isolation system built inside of it. It's a very simple gimbal piston type air, uh, air system, which is a sealed chamber that has an air pressure that forces the, 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 the piston up. And then this piston supports the sensitive components of the instrument. So we have a sealed air chamber. And when we have a sealed air chamber, we're going to have something that's subject to the ideal gas law, to the, iso, the, actually, the isoentropic version of the ideal gas law, where we have the initial pressure and volume of, of, of a cavity needs to equal the final pressure and volume of a cavity. So what happens is we have a long wavelength coming in here, changing the pressure. And so the outside room uh, is going to change in pressure, and that's going to result in a pressure change of the sealed air chamber, chamber of the instrument. So we have a pressure drop, for example, uh, in the environment. We're going to see a pressure increase uh, inside the, uh, the, the isolation system of the tool. And that's going to register as a barometric problem. It's going to be a vibration change. And, uh, and, and that's how it affects the instruments. So there's two types of mitigation. There's a couple different mitigation attempts. Uh, that we have, uh, that we see a lot of folks do when they're trying to mitigate acoustics. Uh, foam paneling is your number one uh, type uh, um, uh, mitigation offense, and it's it's only effective really against audible frequencies because when you design acoustic foam, acoustic foam is going to uh, have structures on it that are on the order of the wavelengths that it's trying to cancel, and so those wavelengths will hit these structures and diffract. But when we start getting the longer and longer and longer wavelengths, they don't care about these structures that are built on acoustic foams and things like that. They help mostly on external noise, but it can help a little bit uh, for sound reflection within the room. We also see people using HVAC baffles and mufflers, which are breaking up um, noise and redirecting noise from HVAC vents. Um, but these mufflers and these uh, baffles and this acoustic foam, they mostly don't affect low frequencies, which uh, really don't have any sort of external mitigation attempt that you can put onto them. You can only really uh, use acoustic enclosures. And that's what we'll talk about next, is acoustic enclosures. So as we mentioned before, um, sound wavelengths uh, of long wavelengths on the order of several meters are the most problematic for sensitive instruments. And uh, we can't really use baffles and redirection and acoustic foams to kind of re to, to, to absorb or diffract these. What we've got to use is we've got to use acoustic enclosures. And the key to acoustic enclosure in an instrument is that it has to be tightly sealed, it's got to be extremely stiff, and it's got to be very massive. And so we have an instrument inside here. Uh, my diagram here shows an acoustic enclosure with an instrument inside supported by air isolators, which are these springs here. And we have acoustic noise, which essentially bounces off. And that's fine. But we have these pressure waves that then are going to be incident on my acoustic enclosure. My acoustic enclosure must have the mass stiffness and the air tightness to be able to withstand those waves. So it makes acoustic enclosures very, very difficult to build because commercially, mass and stiffness is, is difficult to transport. It's difficult to build. Um, and, and you know you have limitations to how massive and stiff you can make an enclosure. One of the things that we also see is we see um, the, the, the temperature rising inside enclosures. So a lot of sensitive instruments are also going to be sensitive to temperature. So when you create a stiff, massive structure and you place an instrument inside of it, and then you try to make that mass structure airtight, you try to keep the external environment out, and then you have an environment inside which might be very quiet, might not have a whole lot of audible or uh, pressure changes inside, which is great. But the better you do that, the more temperature you keep inside the enclosure, and an instrument's going to generate its own heat. And so you start to see temperatures rise in enclosures, which is a major limitation uh, to the effectiveness of an acoustic enclosure. And then you start to have this battle where you put in airflow to try to lower the temperature rise. But then the more airflow you have in there, the more in acoustics you're reintroducing into the em envelope. So mass stiffness is expensive. Airtight gives you temperature rise. And um, you really sort of start to lump, you know, run up into points of diminishing returns as you design enclosures. You also have instru instrument limitations uh, where, because it's a basically a bunker around your instrument, 
you're going to have trouble getting in there and access to do maintenance and things you can uh, and other things. So it's often a very significant design effort to create an enclosure that is effective, that has access, that is affordable, uh, and it has you know a, a, a controlled temperature inside. Some of the best case scenarios on acoustic enclosures is that um, uh, we've seen 10 dB at 20 hertz and uh, 40 dB at higher frequencies. And I'd have to say that's the absolute best you can get inside an enclosure. But they're hard to measure inside because they're imperfect environments. And so you can place your sensor in one location, your microphone in one location, and get one reading, but then get a completely different reading in another location. They're very tricky. So in, summer, in summary, on acoustic enclosures, um, they come in the, the, the disturbances come in the form of audible and inaudible, no, in, uh, inaudible noise. Um, any noise has an effect on tool performance, but when you start getting into long wavelengths, uh, low frequency, you start to see barometric changes that then introduce that then start to interfere with the tool's own internal isolation systems. So most mitigation attempts uh, use HVAC system modifications and foam and things like that. And to be honest, most problems can be solved because most problems are in the audible range. But when you start getting into lower frequencies and barometric changes, really acoustic enclosures are your only uh, are your only option, and they have their own limitations. And that's all I had for today. I'm sorry I went to the very end of the hour, um, but I, I, if anybody that wants to stay on a little bit longer, uh, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to to address them. That was great, Mike. Thanks. Um, yeah, we are a couple minutes past here, but um, it looks like a lot of people are hanging in there. So I, I do have a couple questions, if you can take them. Of course. Um, first one is, uh, what is the speed? Uh, what is the speed of reaction of the sensors and the reaction on perturbation in the active magnet cancellation system? That's a great question. Uh, it, it's, it's on the order of megahertz because these are electronic systems, so it's very fast. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, uh, but we do have a specification for you know how fast that signal uh, go, goes from the sensor to our controller. Um, I'll be able to get your email from later, and I can give you more info. But I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. I can tell you it is on the order of uh, of megahertz, though. So it's very fast. Okay. Yeah, we do get all the questions, so if we don't get to them all, we can respond, uh, you know, via email. Um, next one is, um, is a site analysis always needed, or do pictures of the SEM setup and typical SEM images already give a good indication for the cancellation layout? Uh, you, you're, definitely, you're definitely going to want to get, and th those things will help, for sure. But you need to know the magnitude of the fields that you're trying to cancel. And you can only get that with a survey. And so with the photos and the layout and what your room looks like and things like that, you can get an idea of the needs of a configuration from an ergonomic standpoint and from an installation standpoint. But from a geometric configuration, when you're looking at the sizes and locations of your Helmholtz type coils, you really need to be looking at uh, survey data so you can get that baseline that you're trying to cancel. Good question, thank you. Okay, and then there's, this one's along the same lines, <clears throat> excuse me. Are there simple to use tools to have a rough indication of the disturbing field magnitudes for unexperienced users during pandemic times, like when you can't travel? That's a great question. Um, you know, most manufacturers, TMC included, um, we're going to want to, if you're looking to use that, if you're, if you're looking to use that data to try to specify a magnetic field cancellation system, uh, it's important to get a, some sort of sensing equipment that, you know, is calibrated, it's sensitive, you've got to have an analyzer that can do uh, FFTs and things like that. So, um, you know, you can go to Radio Shack and get an EMF meter and get an idea for your ambient fields, but, uh, but, but those aren't going to give you the frequencies and things like that. I don't even know if Radio Shack's in business anymore, but you could probably get an EMF meter anywhere online. 
Um, or you can go to a, a paranormal investigator website and get one. Um, but, uh, but I'd say that anybody that's gonna be talking about ways to mitigate your fields, they're gonna want to send out an engineer to do a, a survey with calibrated instrumentation. Um, so you can get an idea, I think, with some commercially available meters, but you really got to invest in, in some some analyzer software um, for anybody to want to uh, go and do an analysis as to you know what kind of mitigation you can provide or can be provided, I should say. Thank you. All right, um, that's it for the questions, Mike. Maybe it's uh, time for us to wrap up and uh, thank everybody for for joining us. And yeah, there's Mike's contact information if you have any further questions uh, or follow up. So. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. I'm glad you joined and have a great day. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, Mike.